Hello everybody, I've been beyond fortunate to interview some fantastic footballers on the channel over the past few years. It's time for some of the best bits. I mean, we played Palace in the FA Cup, I think it was a third replay, <clears throat> and they'd, they'd man-marked me the whole game with a guy called Andy Gray, played for England once, and he, he went wherever I went, he man-marked me, which was frustrating to play against. It was quite unusual, really. I wasn't used to that. But eventually we got, we got three in front, there's ten minutes to go, and back in those days, you had like, I think it was one sub, two maximum, I think it was. So after about 80 minutes, the board's gone up and it's 3 0. And like I can see it's my number, number six. So I've trotted off. And I got to where Liam O'Kane is to, like, to just say, well done, son, or whatever. And he, kind of thinking, you're half kind of putting your hand out to say, all the best, son, whoever's going on. <laughs> and there's no one there. I, lo I looked around <laughs> thinking, well, I'm, I'm not injured. So it was going on for me. And I kind of hung around for, I don't know, five seconds thinking, well, are you bringing someone on then? Who's, who's getting the shirt ready or who's getting the, the laces done or whatever? And there was nobody there. So I remember walking to the, down the tunnel thinking, well, that was weird. And then the game continued and nobody came on and we had 10 men. And they won the game 3-0. And I remember thinking, why did he do that? And I remember the ones in the place thinking, he brought nobody on. <laughs> What was he thinking? Because it was 3-0, I mean, the game was done, but you never know football with 10 men. But we won the game easily. And then we had a team meeting on the Friday and uh, everyone had walked out of the team meeting in the guest room and he called me back and he went, Harry, come here a minute. So I walked back and I was thinking, well, what have I done now? And he went, just thought I'd let you know on, on Wednesday night against Crystal Palace. I was just taking the piss out of Crystal Palace. He said, <laughs> you know, I hate the way they play, the rough house tactics. I thought we'd play for 10 minutes with 10 men against them. Wasn't how badly you were playing. I just thought I'd take the piss out of them. Is that all right, son? I went, yeah, fine, Gaffer. Bye. <laughs> and I walked off. When I was at Middlesbrough Football Club at the time, we'd had some uh, really good success, especially the last uh, couple of years I was there, having gone through liquidation uh, and the club had to reform. Um, and I got a phone call. It was in my kitchen. I can remember it being in my kitchen and... Uh, uh, you know, the good old times when actually you had a phone and it actually was attached to something. <laughs> it was attached uh, to a wall. Yeah. It was attached to a wall. And I, I remember picking it up and, uh, and, uh, and it, you know, this, um, this person saying he's Brian Clough and uh, he wanted to have a chat with me and I've gone. And at that time, I'd only just about a week earlier had, uh, had a, like a crank call, which Peter Beagree, uh, who was who gave me a crank call? Said he was somebody else, and trying to get me saying, you know, it's a manager of Blackburn Rovers, and he he, uh, he wanted me to go down, and I hook line and sinker. He had it live in the dressing room, <laughs> so I got. So you can imagine my cautiousness when I'm picking this phone up and I hear this <laughs> voice, uh, and it's like, you know, it's Brian, Clough. young man is Brian Clough, and I I, I, I actually did say, Biggs. It's off. <laughs> and, I put, and I put the phone down and, uh, you know, and I, I just thought it was Biggs again, you know, trying to get me because I thought I caught them out this time. Phone rings again. So anyway, I, I picked it up. I said, Biggs, come on, mate. You've done me once. And he went, who's Biggs? This is Brian Clough. And just all of a sudden it just went, oh, my God, it is him. <laughs> it really is him. And I, I didn't, I was like in, I was just a bit frozen at that moment in time, thinking, well, I don't know what to say now. What do I say? <laughs> I just, I was just apologetic. And he said, if you say that one more time, I'm going to put the phone down myself. So I went, <laughs> all right. Look. So he, um, he just said, get yourself down. I want to see you tomorrow and uh, bring your wife and your kids and, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow in my office. So I put the phone down and half of me thinking, hmm. Now, is Biggs that good? <laughs> Do I actually really travel? Anyway, I had to, I had to, I had to take it. Anyway, I, so I've gone down to Forest, and thankfully, when I got to the reception, they were expecting me and uh, went into his office. And it was lovely to, to obviously meet him. I was so nervous, I have to say. Uh, in, you know, and in, in the one thing that Cluffy seems to do with most people is, is uh, if, you, if you look nervous or whatever, he'll say something just to calm me down. And he went, and he says, come here, give us a kiss, you know. And it was like, okay, I'm, I'm all right now. All right. Uh, anyway, yeah. he sat us down um, and I think it was Ron Fenton took my wife out um, around the ground and the kids were following. And uh, he just had, he just come out and says, no, serious business. 
he said, are you a good player or a bad player? And I'm going, well, uh, well I suppose because I'm here, you, you, you obviously think I'm a good player. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> he says, let me tell you, son, I've not seen you play. So I'm like thinking, he's winding me up here. Uh, a manager that hasn't gone out and seen a player play, I'm thinking, this can't be right. I said, seriously, he went, I haven't seen you play, son. I don't know what you like. Are you a good player or a bad player? I said, well, I think I'm a good player. He says, well, we'll see. We'll see. I still want to sign you, but we'll see. But if you're a good player, you tell everybody I signed you. And if you're a crap player, and I mean crap, Ron Fenton signed you. I'd only worked with English managers at, at Forest with Paul, Joe Kinnear, uh, Gary Mason. You know, this they, they were the managers that I worked with, whereas you go to the next level, you're working with foreign managers. Yeah, I went with Martin Yolo, who I thought was fantastic. Uh, I had a, a group of players that he got playing for him. They all, we all loved him. Uh, and then Ramos came, came in, he couldn't speak the language. That was completely different, different way of training, different way of playing. Coming to England for him, I thought he found it hard. That was probably my first time in football that I went through a period in my career where I was I had no confidence whatsoever. Um, and now I look back, when I got to the age of 30, it sort of stood me in good stead going forward in, in life because to, to, I went through an awful lot then. I thought my, my Spurs career was coming to an end. I was got a lot of criticism and, and that's when it was hard for me. It really, really was on a personal level, not just on a football level, because everywhere I went, I was getting stick. It was hard. Um, you know, and I, and I speak about connection with the Forest fans and the Spurs fans. I, incredible. But I did go through a period there where one as a team, we were struggling and to me individually. So that was a real, real hard, hard time. But as soon as Harry came in, incredible. He got me back playing to the best format I had in my career. Got me in the England squad. He got me to a World Cup. Um, How did that happen? How does you know what? What is it that Harry Redknapp has that gets you out of that slump and confidence. playing for England? Yeah, confidence. I, I say this from now. I mean, now I'm in the media and punditry. I can I can see players going through what I went through then. So I have an empathy for them. I do. People sit there and sit behind the screen. It's easy when you're there. It's easy to say oh, he's not playing well. Uh, I look at a player at Manchester United where some of the things he does now and a few years ago, he was, he was a world beater. And I feel for him. He's got no confidence whatsoever. He's in, under scrutiny every minute of the day. Uh, and if you could pay for confidence, a lot of people would buy it. And you only realise that when you come out the other side. Um, I was getting brought off. I was out of the team. But then Harry came in, he just had belief. We had two points from eight games with Gareth Bale, Luka Modric, Robbie Keane. Ledley King, Berber, to two points in eight Premier League games. Wow. That's a team that's getting relegated. You're talking about world-class players who have been arguably the best players in the world. Gaz was in the top three or four in the world not long after that with Messi and Ronaldo. And we had two points from eight games in the Premier League. He came in, he made, we had a happy camp. He let us go out and play with attacking football. He didn't do a lot. He just got belief in make, making... Players believe that they're good players. Uh, and we ended up, I think, finished seventh or eighth that season. It was remarkable after eight games. I think Cluffy kind of like notices little things, little chinks in the armour where you're getting a little bit too big for your boots. And after that game, I was going home, parents and that, and he said, I said, after the game, I said, see you to the rest of the lads. Have a good weekend. Where are you going, shit house? He said. I said, I'm going home. Where's home? I said, I live in Barnsley. My house tomorrow morning, nine o'clock, bring your boots. And it would help if you bring your gloves as well, <laughs> son. <laughs> so, like, I didn't know where he lived. So I had to, I, Chaz, the groundsman, I had to ask him if he'd take me to his house on the Sunday morning. I don't know why I'm going. Drops me off at his house at half eight. I woke up the drive at five to nine. Barbara answers the door. Hello, Mark. How are you doing? I'm Barbara, Brian's wife. Well done yesterday. Lovely to meet you. Glad it's going really well for you. And come in and make you a cup of tea and a slice of toast and sat in the kitchen. Still ain't got a clue why I'm there. She said, Brian's upstairs. He'll be down in a couple of minutes. Anyway, he comes in. He said, I won't call you shit out, son, because Barbara's here. He said. <laughs> but I'd like to say thank you. So I said, what for? Now, 
Simon at that time, Simon Clough, Nigel's brother, who was now chief scout with Nigel, wherever he works, was the manager of a team called AC Hunters in Division 5 of the Derbyshire Sunday League. <laughs> and they didn't have a goalkeeper. <laughs> so he said, thank you, son, for agreeing to play for Simon's team this morning. <laughs> They haven't got a goalkeeper, and I thought you'd do. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking, I've just played against Liverpool, Newcastle and Coventry, and the next day I'm playing for AC Hunters in Division 5 of the Derby Sunday League. Cut a long story short, I'm playing in that game. Uh, the standard is horrendous. The, the pitch has got dog shit and broken glass all over it. Archie Gemmel, who was obviously a friend of the family and a youth team coach at Forest, he's the linesman, right? <laughs> right. So I can't get my head around that. Archie's running <laughs> up and down the line. I'm playing in goal. What's happening? Cut a long story short, we won that game quite comfortably. And AC Hunters got fined 50 quid for playing a ringer and got the points took off him. So I was the ringer. But Cluffy took the £50 out of my wages at Forest. <laughs> To pay to pay the fine, <laughs> so I had to pay the fine for playing. <laughs> and that's just you like, didn't want to. It's just like when I look back now and go. At the time, I thought, "What's this idiot doing to me?" You know. But when I look back now, I go, "How class is that?" We, we were having a crap time of it as it was because we were fighting. At the, at the wrong end of the of the division for a team that had always managed to to perform the great escape, and quite obviously as history pans out, that wasn't going to be the case this season. Um, we played Arsenal. Harry Redknapp was in charge. I'd been booked already. I mean, the first challenge on I think it was on Matthew Flamini, who is now some kind of reu re renewable energy billionaire, isn't he? So is that right? No, I didn't know that. Yeah. So so our our. <laughs> Your parts have got yes. yeah, sli slightly different, <laughs> slightly different. Um, and I was proper pumped up, uh, and I'm sure there's, there's possibly one or two Forest fans of a certain era that would testify to what I was like when I was pumped up, which was probably out of control. And uh, so went to tackle him, Alan Wiley, who since I've worked with and, and get on with really, really well, booked me and kind of was like what on earth are you doing? Can you just calm down? And then I went to tackle Robert Perez, <laughs> which again, me, me and him in the same sentence, let alone on the same pitch is laughable. Um, and thought in my very sane, taking it, oh, I won the ball there. He's French man, diving all over the place. And I remember seeing a, a picture on the, on the Monday morning, which was like my face contorted in rage with a straight leg on his ankle and his ankle was bent and he was like, uh, like that. Uh, and then it all kind of kicked off and me remonstrating, pleading my innocence, the classic, whoa, whoa, never touched him. Never touched him, ref. Never touched him, ref. And then the, the linesman flags gets him over. And by this time, I'm like, what's the linesman getting involved for and dipping around and... So that so the image that you see from that is me trying to move Alan Wiley, who bless him is up, like I said, love Alan's a bit, is about here on me. <laughs> right. So I'm looking over his head, moving him around, not to like knock him out, but like, I, I, I mean I don't know what I was going to do once I got to the linesman. I'm like just admonish him or whatever. Um, but that's it. Just looks like me manhandling officials. I mean, which in any sport, in any in any kind of professional environment, is absolutely obviously a no-no. So then he books, because I, I don't even think it was a red card. I think he booked me, just booked me again. So two red card offences that I actually just got two yellows for. Not that this was my um, my argument in the dressing room after. No. And this was just before half time. And um, Harry comes in and, he, I mean, his voice can be quite high pitched anyway, but I mean, it was off the scale. He was absolutely raging. Um, and then as the, as the day kind of transpired, it, you realise then that it's, it's going to become bigger then um, Nutter in football match goes Nutter. It becomes a, 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 a bit bigger than that. And obviously with the company that I work for, um, we love rolling news. <laughs> so mm. it's easy to play it again and again and again and again. <laughs> um, so you had to deal with the fallout from that, which was a lot of people in the papers. It's quite rightly calling me an idiot. 
I mean, a, a, a reflection on footballers of a certain bracket that are animals, basically. Um, uh, and I think my, I'm trying to think my mum and dad were there as well. So, I mean, a doubly proud moment that my parents got to see it in the flesh, <laughs> exactly where it was. And then uh, off the back of that, me and Harry had to go to the FA in Soho Square to go and get the knuckles wrapped once again. So you go around this big board table in these lovely wood panelled offices, three men that, I mean, average age of about 95, <laughs> someone from, I don't know, pluck one out, Shropshire FA, somebody from there, someone there. And and I had Mick Maguire, former footballer who worked at the PFA, now works for, I think works for a talent management agency. And he, he was my um, counsel, my uh, rep. So he, he, he went in and he was chatting away about um, where we, we were trying to mitigate. So he went through professional season by season, my disciplinary record, which the more he's saying it, I'm sort of like going, Jesus, mate, this isn't helping, mate. Oh, but was it was like, see, I wouldn't have had you as bad. Well, the first season, so first full season, <clears throat> I think it was around 15 yellow cards and a red card. Ah, ah okay. And I think... So it was always double figures, I think, from from yellows right. and with the odd red thrown in. So, but then it had got marginally better. But I thought, if you start there and, and just what, mm. and, and I just saw the the fellas like looking at <laughs> like what, and then they went out to go and to go and um, deliberate. And then Harry had to shoot off. He said, "Christ, Prots, you you've got more previous than Reggie Cray," <laughs> 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 which I thought was a was a very it's good very line. Funny line. Yes. Yeah, but I thought, I can't, I can't come back in and start laughing. And then they came back in and said, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get a 10-match ban. You're going to get fined X amount of money. Uh, and that's it. You know what I mean? You're going to have to take it on the chin. You're going to have to deal with the media consequences of it. And, and, and the great irony as well of it was, was we had 11 games left. So it wasn't even like season over. Not that I was going to go, oh, Gaffer, by the way, can I get myself off for a couple of weeks because <laughs> uh because that would have gone down like uh, a final lift wasn't it but then so then uh, as the seats are watched kind of gnawing my nails as the season progressed and we were looking like we're getting out of it and we'd slip back and we're looking like we're getting out of it then i came back for the last game of the season which was man united at home after not playing for the best part of two months two and a half months and i started the game then right i tried my best to stay fit but we were just nowhere near it and i think so that i think it was called survival sunday i think but it was in our hands. If we'd have won, we'd have stayed up. But we, oh Christ, we just weren't good enough to beat Man United. Well, I think we were more shocked by Steve McLaren because, and it's no disrespect to Steve, and to be honest with you, I don't really care what people think of it, but he was never going to be a fit for Nottingham Forest in a million years. I have no idea how you sat Billy Davis and then you land on Steve McLaren. I just don't yeah. know how that happens. I really because don't. They're so, because they're so opposite. They're so opposite, polar opposites, uh, personality, uh, probably their philosophy on football, probably the, the way they deal with things, the way they deal with people. It just didn't look a fit. And players ain't stupid. They're not, footballers aren't thick. They know what's going on. And you know, immediate, the, the, as soon as somebody walks in the door, if it's going to be a success and you buy into the ideas and you give everything you give, but you just know that this isn't going to work. And it just didn't work. The recruitment of the players that come in, and this is no disrespect to the players that came in the door, but they did, they weren't the players that were needed to replace the players that had left because the whole dynamic of the team completely changed. And you're now going, it's like a 180 shift. You're going from a certain young, vibrant team that's um, energetic, in your face, aggressive, you know, young, full of testosterone, all them sort of stuff to an older group, which has got senior players in it who play a different way. So immediately the squad is completely changed. Yeah. You've got because it was squad that's all just to pick up, you've you've got Greening and Boateng coming in, who had both been very, very fantastic good players. players. Fantastic but... players, great characters, and added so much into the change room, but they weren't at that time in their careers the right players for what that team was. Now they might have been the right players for the way Steve McLaren wanted to play and the way he wanted to do things, but it wasn't enough compared to what you had. So then you had a complete disconnect in terms of how the players had played for probably two and a half years under Billy, certainly two, four years with me, but obviously he was there for the six months before. So that was ingrained to him. So a completely different style. And then 
he brings in different back. You, also, Billy goes, you lose the backroom staff. And that backroom staff was a good backroom staff who had good relationship with players and did a lot with the players, not just on the training ground, but also in terms of in the gym, in their minds, helping them with all the things. There's a lot of stuff that goes on that people don't see. They all go. And in comes a, a you know, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank, great guy, fantastic player. It's his first coaching job. And I'm not sure that he was the right fit for Nottingham Forest at the time. A sports scientist comes in who barely speaks English. And it's like, what's going on here? How, how this is so polar opposites to where we are and what we are. And then a natural divide creates because you've got a, a Billy Davis section. And it's not a bad section that's going, oh, we want Billy. We're, we're not going to buy into it. We're, it's gonna, there's going to have to be a, a period of time where there's like a culture shift. You've got to allow these players to change their culture and change the way that you want to do it because the players that Steve McLaren brought in and the stuff that he brought in, they was on his, on, on his path. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more videos, you can watch here. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel.